All right, today we want to talk about uh, radar and how radar can be used to track thunderstorm movement. We're going to actually have a little history of radar. Some interesting things I've learned as I have been uh, studying this, so it's kind of cool. Hey, radar, I'm not sure you need to copy all this down, but just a little history of it. First of all, radio, uh, radar stands for radio detection and ranging. The RA is the part for radio. That means it's using uh, radio frequencies. Actually, I think they use microwave. That's kind of odd. Always uh, a little brief history here. In 1904, this guy named Christian Holzmeier, sounds German, demonstrated the feasibility of detecting the presence of a ship in dense fog, but he couldn't tell how far it was. And then 1917, a guy named Mr. Nikolai Tesla, he's actually a very famous scientist, established the principles regarding the frequency and power level for the first primitive radar units. And then the Brits in World War II um, were afraid that the Germans were developing what, uh, something called a death ray, uh, which, they, which was the radar. Well, it turns out when they did their study, they realized that they could uh, propagate electromagnetic energy. All right, we learned about that in our astronomy chapters, uh, electromagnetic energy, and uh, long and short, they were able to determine um, uh, where airplanes were and such. So it's very important for them to say, oh, uh, the Germans are coming with their airplanes during some of the raids in World War II. So it was very important. Then after World War II, all these scientists who were developing these radar things, they also used radar in World War II to detect ships and uh, things of that nature on the ocean. Um, but after World War II, the scientists who um, were working on the mi military stuff uh, became civilians, and then they said, oh, I wonder if we could use this to determine um, meteorological issues in terms of uh, uh, predicting the weather, because they realized that it also you could uh, detect weather. So, um, yeah, it start, so it kind of really started uh, the detection of uh, using radar for weather-related issues kind of after World War II. So the science of meteorology has changed significantly because of that. Now, how does radar work? Well, weather radars send what's called a directional pulse of microwave radiation on the order of a microsecond long. So what they do is they have this, uh, this dish, and we'll see a little video that will illustrate this a little bit better. Um, and they send out a pulse. And this pulse sends out, um, you know, it's an electromagnetic pulse. Remember we talked about waves um, when we learned about electromagnetic radiation or astronomy unit. So they send out those waves, which have a particular wavelength. They know how long it is, in fact. And, uh, and they know how long it is, and then it, it hits something. And when it hits something, maybe out here, uh, a hailstone maybe or something like that, it's going to bounce back. So the radar turns on, and then it waits for just a, a, a microsecond for... Um, uh, the pulse to return, and then it tells you when it hits something how far that something is away. And if it's a very strong return, then it's hit something big, like a hailstone versus a rain droplet, etc. And uh, if you might notice here, there's all kinds of like math here. They got the h pulse height, and they got the pulse time length, and there's also this angle right here, which they call theta. There's all kinds of different uh, things that uh, play a role here. And in fact, if you really want to get into it, don't, don't copy this down, but I just want to show you that, that science is all about the mathematics, isn't it? This is the equation that determines how big the pulse is. Um, so when, when, this, uh, you know, when the pulse goes out and it hits something in the cloud right here, it returns. Well, you've got this angle, theta, right? There's theta. Uh, and then you've got um, R, and then you've got H for the height, and HA, and basically all these level uh, things, if you look in here, are in this equation, square root, square, oh my gosh, that looked like a crazy equation. And that can give you the H value, and the H value is how strong the pulse is that was returned. All right, And then what they can do is they, they uh, change it into a color. Actually, I want to put it here. Um, so the radar returns are usually described by color or level. So that's that H in that equation. The colors in the radar are normally ranged from blue or green for weak returns and red or magenta for strong returns. You don't have to copy all this down, but I just want to get the ideas. It gives you a number. That equation gives you 65 or 52 or 36 or 20 or whatever. And so when you know that number, it can then be plotted as a color on this map here. And so here is, uh, I think this is somewhere in Canada or something like that. This is a, a radar map in Canada. And if you look here at this uh, diagram here, here we have a pretty strong return here. And um, uh, strong returns up in, in this region too. And so this is kind of, a, I don't know, somewhere in Canada, it's not important. But we can see how in, more intense is, the more magenta, all right? Notice the number here, 75, and remember those numbers that that equation gave you. So the radar actually gives you a bunch of numbers. 
Uh, when you watch the Weather Channel or the, the meteorology thing at night on the news when you have like severe weather, you just see all the colors, but you don't realize the colors actually represent numbers that come back um, from that equation that we looked at right here. So it's really, you know, it's the math, folks. Yes, that's right. It's all about the math. Isn't it amazing? Side note here. Um, why do we not have any returns in this region or uh, in this region? Well, if you look here, um, uh, zones without data in the southwest and east are caused by beam blocking from mountains. So the mountains get in the way and they don't know. There probably still was rain and such in these areas, but the mountains blocked them. So that's one of the things is there are some limits to radar, which leads to me. If the limits to the radar thing is because of the a couple of things. The Earth's curvature limits radar range. Um, to about 285 miles. So it can't see further than 285 miles because, of course, the Earth is uh, curved. And if you've got your satellite or your uh, radar detector, this is a radar detector right here, right? A radar um, uh, set, um, dish. Um, it can only see a certain distance because then the curvature of the Earth gets in the way. Um, uh, but because radar, other issues is it detects tall buildings, mountains, and other things. Those other things are called ground color. It'll even detect um, uh, cars driving down the road. So. <clears throat> That's called ground clutter, so they have to sort of figure out when that doesn't count. So what parts count, what's related to the weather, and what's ground clutter. Um, in fact, let's watch a short video clip that kind of explains how this all works. This is our Doppler radar that we use at the National Weather Service. Inside that what appears to be a large white soccer ball is a 28-foot diameter satellite dish that focuses a short pulse of very high-energy microwave radiation, almost in like a microwave bullet. It sends that information out, and as soon as it shoots that bullet out, it shuts off and goes into a listening mode, and it really waits for that energy to hit something, bounce off it, and be returned back to the radar. Now, in addition to raindrops, cloud particles, and hailstones, that uh, radar is very sensitive. It'll also pick up dust particles, uh, birds in the air, even things on the ground like uh, trucks that are moving on highways and trees. When the energy is returned back from the rain and the hail, uh, we import that into a pretty high, pretty sophisticated, uh, high-powered computer system that converts it into data that we can look at and is readily available in our forecasting workstations. Well, hopefully that was instructional for you and you were able to understand how that works. Okay, now this leads us to some more discussions about uh, thunderstorms. Now thunderstorms, some other parts of thunderstorms are actually more types of thunderstorms. The first one is called a squall line. Squall lines are really quite fascinating. It's an elongated band of thunderstorm cells. Remember we have one thunderstorm cell, we learned about that in the previous podcast. And we can see um, in this picture over here on the right um, that we have a band. This is a, a view of space right here um, somewhere in uh, Mexico. And we have a whole line of thunderstorms. There's a thunderstorm, there's a thunderstorm, but they're in a line and they're all in a row and this is called a squall line and this forms when a warm humid air so it's not going to happen in a cold place along or just ahead of a well-defined cold front so basically they're gonna you know you get this warm humid air humid air and it hits a cold front and you get a squall line and it can get very exciting sometimes like this some things about a squall line 